Good morning, church. Good morning. morning. How are we this morning? Good, yeah. Um, We're officially in the Christmas season now. Aren't we glad? Yeah, we are, yeah. I'll tell you a a very small joke. Um, So a magistrate um, asked a prisoner in the court, um, uh, what are you charged with? And the prisoner said, um, doing Christmas shopping too early. And the magistrate said, well, that's not um, a case for um, charging. So how early is, um, were you doing this Christmas shopping? To which the prisoner said, uh, before they opened the shop. <laughs> yeah. So in this Christmas season, um, it's a busy season, I'm sure, and we're all very busy in our own preparations. Um, so this morning, just to readjust our focus, and um, let's look at the life of John the Baptist. Um, and through the life of John the Baptist, let's learn about how to get our preparations for the season right so we can keep Christ in our Christmas. Right. So the title for the message this morning is Prepare With Me featuring John. Right. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we come into your holy presence this morning, Lord. And Father, we thank you for giving us the privilege to gather this morning and we thank you for helping us enter into one more Christmas season in our lives, Lord. And Father, this morning I pray that you would speak to each one of us and meet us at a point of our need, Lord. Father, help us, Father, Lord, to keep our focus on you in this season, Lord. And Father, open our hearts and minds to your word because, Lord, your word alone has the power to change us, to convict us, and to lead us to repentance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, preparation. So for good results, we all need preparation, and uh, to be more precise, the right kind of preparation. So this is a season where um, our bellies are overstuffed, our hearts are overwhelmed, and sometimes Jesus is overlooked. So we allowed Christmas to be more about this created stuff than it is about the incarnation of the Creator Himself. And through this excitement, of Christmas season, sometimes this excitement overshadows the true meaning of Christmas. And there is a very, it's very easy for each of us to become like Martha when only one thing is necessary, and that is to savor Jesus Christ like Mary, who understood the importance of Jesus' visit and sat at his feet. So in these four weeks before Christmas, um, and by the way, the four weeks before Christmas um, is also called Advent, Um, And uh, it is a tradition followed in several uh, traditional churches um, to help prepare, uh, to help believers prepare their hearts and minds um, for the Christ, for the arrival of of Messiah. And it is looking back to the first coming of Jesus Christ as a savior and also looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ as a judge in the future. Now, whether or not we follow this tradition, But the element of preparation for the season is something that we can grab onto. And the significant preparation that needs to happen is in our hearts and minds. And so how does this happen? Well, let's take a look. So let's turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 3, starting verse 2, for our reading today. Luke chapter 3, starting verse 2. While Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones, And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. 
Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let them give to him who has none, and he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. Now as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And with many other exhortations, he preached to the people. Um, I'm skipping to the to verse 21. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus was also baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, and in you I am well pleased. Amen. Amen. I'd like to take three to four minutes here to shed light on the life of this passionate prophet, John the Baptist. So if we read verse 15 in our reading today, it said, Now as the people were in expectation and all reason in their hearts about John. So the people at that time were expecting, were eagerly waiting for a prophet to come, a prophet that would come before the Messiah as prophesied in Malachi. So Malachi was the last book, is the last book in in the Old Testament of the Bible. And it ends with a prophecy about the coming Messiah and also about a prophet that would come before the Messiah. And also there is Isaiah who prophesied a lot about the coming Messiah and also about John the Baptist saying, A voice in the wilderness crying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. So these Old Testament prophecies um, ended and then the New Testament. And there is, between the Old Testament and New Testament, a 400-year gap. So in these 400 years, it was silent, the 400 years of silence. There was no word from God, there was no scripture, and there was no prophet, and the people were fast sinking into sin. So these 400 years of silence in our Bible are represented by the one blank page between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And if you are keen, you can make a little research on what happened in the 400 years, and it is... It is quite interesting. Um, So quite a few people ask me um, if I am or was a teacher by profession. And I said no, but just now I'm thinking I should have said yes and so I can give you some homework. (laughs) So so in these 400 years, there is no, no prophet. And then after that, suddenly, John the Baptist surfaces. Now, John the Baptist is not your regular guy. So he used to live in the wilderness. He used to wear clothes made of camel's hair and a leather belt. And he ate locusts, kind of bugs and honey. So eating bugs might bug you and me, but it did not bug John. And John, when he was in this wilderness, God gave a word to him and called him to embark on this mission of preparing a way for the Messiah, to be a herald for the coming king, to be the forerunner for the Son of God. And so John came after this 400, suddenly after this 400 years of silence, a man from the wilderness came and started preaching and started telling about the word, about a coming Messiah, and all the people were intrigued. They were drawn for, towards this overpowering message, and they came, in, and they came in huge numbers to be baptized, to hear John and to be baptized by John. And John's message was not at all sugar-coated. He was very sharp and direct and straight. And he rebuked people saying, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Repent and be baptized. That was the message of John the Baptist. 
And now John the Baptist's life is characterized by a total submission and faith and devotion to Jesus Christ and his kingdom. He introduced Jesus Christ as the lamb that has come for the sins of the world. He baptized Jesus Christ and he bore a witness to the Jesus Christ that he, Jesus Christ, is the light, is the true light for all men in the darkness. And there are two unique things about John the Baptist. One is he is the prophet and also the fulfillment of a prophecy. And the other one is he is the messenger by God to prepare a way for the Messiah and also was to announce the arrival of the Messiah and serve him with his own hands. This is something that none of the prophet did in the past. And Jesus himself in Matthew 11, he says, John the Baptist is a prophet and is more than a prophet. And he says, among all the, all the people born of women, none is greater than John the Baptist. So John the Baptist, with his character and with his divine calling, is found greater than all the other men that are born besides Jesus Christ. So that is John the Baptist for you, his powerful mission, his powerful ministry, and his powerful life. And now this um, total submission of John's life to holiness, his living in the desert, and his unique life, it reminds us, of, reminds us to prioritize our spiritual needs to our earthly desires, to put God first. And so in this Christmas season, this is the first lesson that we learn from John the Baptist in our preparation in the season, to put God first. So John was very focused in his mission. He did not let anything, any of the world cares, distract him. He was in the wilderness. It was just him and God. And all the four gospel writers wrote about John the Baptist. And if we see what John wrote about John the Baptist, and if we see, if we turn to 1 John, we can see that John the Baptist, time and again, time and again, he um, exalted none but Jesus Christ. He puts Jesus Christ first, and he gave him all the glory that Jesus Christ is rightly due. If we see in verse 8, I'll just quickly read. If we see in verse 8, John says, He is not the light, but only a witness of the true light that is Jesus Christ. In verse 20, he says, He is not the Christ when people asked if he was. In 21, John says he is not the Elijah, not the prophet. In verse 27, John says he's not worthy to unstrap Jesus' sandals. And if we jump a few, a few chapters to John chapter 3, we can see some more beautiful statements from John. And I'll just read verses 28 to 30 from John chapter 3. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. The joy of John is complete when all the attention turns to Jesus and away from him. He must increase, but I must decrease. And as we enjoy and enter into this Christmas season, this should be our heart's desire and this should be our attitude that he must increase and everything else must decrease. The, we, we can find the, the total, the complete joy in our hearts only if we put God first, only if we let him satisfy our souls because only he can satisfy our souls and nothing else and nobody else. And John the Baptist, let nothing else come in the way of Jesus, neither himself nor any situation, and we shouldn't either. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be added unto you. Familiar verse, Matthew 6, 33. So Jesus demands, or Jesus commands, that we love him. We love him more than anyone else or more than anything else, that we adore him, worship him, delight in him, follow him. And just like John the Baptist, we say, yes, Lord, we do. Be my Lord, O oh Lord. Because if we don't, there is all this, the buzz around us that could dictate our actions. And there is a danger of anything that replaces God in our hearts to become an idol. So we should put our complete focus on Jesus Christ in this season. To put God first means we're telling Jesus Christ there's no one no one or nothing is about you, and no one and no checklist, no message is about your word to me. And we can put Jesus Christ first, we can put God first in our lives easily, 
if our heart is in the right place. So which is the second preparation for us in this season to prepare our hearts, get our hearts right. Hearts are very important to God. And so in this season, it's, it's best we take some time out and engage in sober self-examination of how our heart is. If we see Psalm 139, verses 24, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there is any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. We sit, we self-examine, we sit. And if God points anything, we immediately repent. We turn away and we turn to God. Repent for the kingdom of God is near is the message of John the Baptist. And Jesus Christ also, the first message when he started preaching is, repent for the kingdom of God is near. If you see Matthew 4, 17, it says, From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repentance is a call for a total inward change. And in our reading today in Luke chapter 3, we see uh, an interesting uh, relationship between repentance and bearing fruits. Repentance and changed behavior. So verse 8 says, Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. So all these people came to John and asked him, so what shall we do? What shall we do? And John says, gives these examples and says, well, these are the fruits that you will bear in keeping with repentance. And they are, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. These are the fruits of the repentance. And repenting is what happens inside of us that leads to the fruits of this new behavior. And if you continue reading, Luke we'll see the Isaiah's prophecy. I'll just read it from verses 4 to 6. It says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough way smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So in John's time, whenever King, King, King went to visiting places, the messenger would send a word to remove any obstacles from the road and to make the road straight for the king to come, for the king to pass. So this is a symbolic and a representation and a description of what should happen to people's heart as they wait for the coming Messiah. So the proud and the lofty who have exalted himself must be brought low. Those who are oppressed must be lifted up. And all the thorns and the obstacles and stones in our hearts that are choking our hearts in the form of sin They should be removed. So we have to repent of any sin that is blocking in our hearts. So we prepare our hearts and we prepare him room in this season by self-examining and by repenting of all the sins and turning away from them and turning to God. And the third preparation that we can do in this season is pointing people to Christ. So if we read um, John chapter 1 again, starting verse 19. Now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make stride the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Notice what John says in verse 23. He says, I am the voice. He's the God-appointed voice. And this chapter 1, the, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. So the Word is Jesus Christ, and the voice was John the Baptist. This voice carried the Word. The voice that carried the Word in that time was John the Baptist, proclaiming the coming of the Messiah. And the voice that can carry God's love today can be you and me proclaiming the good news that Jesus Christ has come to this world in a, bodily, in a human form to die on the cross and to rescue you and me from sin. Proclaiming that we desperately need a savior and if he wanted, he could have stayed on the throne, but he didn't. He came for the love because he came to rescue you and me from our sins, from our wretched state. Proclaiming that he's going to come again as a king to reign forever. 
Friends, church, we have this wonderful, the best good news in the world that we can share. That Jesus Christ became one of us to reconcile us to himself. Jesus Christ wants to know us and wants to be known by us and through us. And so preaching or sharing his love and sharing his word is a privilege that we should not forego. It says in um, Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Christmas, as they say, is a wonderful time. And it indeed is a wonderful time for us to share God's love in our communities, in our families, and in our workplaces. Everybody knows Christmas, so people are generally receptive to hear the true spirit of Christmas in this season. A simple Christmas wish can be an opening conversation opener, and we can invite people to our churches to see a nativity play or for a carol service. We can bake some cookies and distribute uh, to our neighbors. We can um, send shoeboxes. We can invite people for a cup of coffee. Or we can visit those who are maybe sad and lonely at this time. There are a number of ways we can show, show and share God's love in this season. But at the same time, we should be careful not to get carried away with this. But we should pray, we should plan, we should share, and then we should leave it to God for him to bless the, the, the work that we did. Because God honors even the simplest of efforts that we do. John the Baptist um, preached the coming of Messiah very boldly and with authority. And a lot of people were attracted to the power in his words that they went. They flocked in hundreds and went and heard him and got baptized. He left no leaf unturned to proclaim the coming Messiah and we shouldn't either. So in this Christmas season, let's prepare ourselves the right way by putting God first and by preparing our hearts and by pointing people to Jesus Christ. I just want to conclude by telling you a short story. So there was this um, little girl by the name Steph, and she um, was quite excited about uh, her nativity play the next day, but she wouldn't tell her mom what role she was playing in the Christmas play. And so her mom, looking at her excitement, thought must be one of the main characters. And the next day, the play started, and uh, Mum was sitting in the audience, and there was Mary and Joseph and Gabriel on the stage, and this little Steph was off the stage, sitting on a chair, but looking at, onto the stage with eyes wide open. And then the teacher signaled to Steph, and immediately she picked up a star that is next to her, and then ran onto the stage. And then there was Mary and Joseph, and she held the star high up above them. And then on the next scene, there were wise men, and she held the star high up again for them to point to the star. And in the last scene of the manger, the complete scene, she held the star high up again. And then after the play was finished, they were going back home, and little Steph told her mom, Mom, I had the important part to play in the nativity. And the mom asked, did you? And she said, yes, I showed everyone where Jesus was. So, so yes, that indeed is an important role that you and I also can play in this season to show everyone Jesus Christ. So in this Christmas season, let's get our preparations right by keeping Christ in the center of our celebrations. Let's be the voice and let's be that star in our communities pointing people to Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the word. We thank you for speaking to us, Lord. And Father, we pray, Lord, that we would take these words, Father, and that we would remember to keep you in the center of all our preparations throughout this season. And also enjoy, Father, Lord, this season, because, Lord, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you came to us to rescue us. And this is a reason for us that we celebrate this season, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.